So remember, this is the King James Bible and the Great Awakening revivals, so Christianity was in full swing. Recall that the Roman Catholic Empire now crumbled. America became a very great and powerful nation. The Lord was mightily using that. I mean, America was founded on uh, godly principles and beginnings. Now, of course, you can argue that they were full of deists, rebellious, and other problems. Uh, no country uh, is without fault. So you, you can dig up dirt on that one, too. But nevertheless, like I told you, unlike any other country uh, besides the nation of Israel that you've seen in history, America is the Gentile nation that started with some what of a godly or Baptist principle. That's why the Lord can use the Great Awakening revi revivals full swing. Amen. So that was that time period. And because the Catholic Roman, uh, the Roman Catholic Empire crumbled, they can't do public control anymore. They have to go through private means. So then through private secretive means, that's where we finally get our Illuminati and other globalists that you hear about today. But it was all underground, it was all in secret, and it is for real. They really wanted to control the world. They want to put an influence in the world, change them toward their thinking. And they had strong admiration to Jesuit principles, Catholic principles. You cannot separate Catholicism from these secret organizations. It was an Illuminati, skull and bones. But it was through, finally, the round table where they were able to have public control or public attention, and they were able to remain. A skull and Bones Illuminati, it was so secretive that there's no proof that it continued on today. Now, uh, personally, I myself believe that they continued on some way, but uh, when you look at uh, historical records, you can't find them alive and moving today. That's why the round table that is the historical record. That is the public truth where they remained. They lasted. Round table transferred into CFR and many other big name organizations that you hear about today. Big name globalists you hear about today. So that's how they were able to succeed. But why were they able to succeed? No, why were they able to finally take control over the public today? All right, the round table they were able to publicly remain and continue at the same time period when the revised version came out. So notice right here, Christianity and Great Awakening Revival was strong. This had to be in secret. But now that the power has been weakened, the authority of the Word of God has been weakened through the revised version. So it's always things that are revised, modernized. When things are revised and modernized, you corrupt the traditional yes. principles that the Lord used in the beginning yep. to make you great, to really bless you, to spiritually thrive you. Mm. Okay, so when you hear that word new, revise, modernize, then automatically it should be a negative reference. Yep. Remember that, it should be a negative reference. So if you keep that in mind, then when we talk about our modern centuries, modern society, automatically it should be a negative thing to you. Yeah. Like, oh, we've been corrupted. Yeah. We've been tainted. When something's been modernized, revised, remember that means it's been tainted. Because why should you revise? Why should you modernize? Why should you correct if the foundation, that tradition that you started right with the Lord is all right. It doesn't have to be corrected. See? So if they modernize or correct that, that means there's something wrong with them, not the uh, traditional aspects. Okay. So remember that. So it was at the revised version, they were able to succeed and control the world now, influence our whole world because the authority of the word of God weakened. So then Christianity, as they go through that revised version, they ended up in this kind of a culture. So it is a Catholic communist culture. How did we end up there? World War I, World War II changed everything. It, the round table was coincidentally at that time. You can find conspiracies, you can find some strange things that elites have either deliberately caused or they were grossly negligent and either way you are penalized in court for those 
all right? So whether they had good intentions where they were very grossly negligent or they were insidious and deliberately caused things, the point is you should be seriously penalized in court for that one. So there are so many cases of that that even secular, unbelieving historians, and yes, even liberal scholars in universities will admit have happened. Uh, when you go back to Pearl Harbor, when you go back to strange things in World War I, World War II, and especially right now, we talk about 9-11 and other stuff. So it's very strange that all these incidents occurred at the same time that these guys came to the scene. And I've given you some uh, interesting documentations concerning them on that. But that time era showed who the winners are now. So remember, after World War II, the winners are America with Europe and uh, Russia, or USSR, the communists that time. So because these are the winners, they dominate our culture now, okay? So it will be American, European, or a communist culture that will dominate our world. What happened is the American, European culture, as I've showed you, the Catholic Church, uh, the number one religion, I promise you this, the number one religion you can find the most elites is not Islam, even though that's the fastest growing religion in the world. The number one religion you will find that's mostly used among uh, rich elites today or globalists is the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church, uh, there are so many documented historical, and I mean historical, not conspiracy stuff, historical evidence is of the Catholic Church tied to the Nazi Party. The Catholic Church, uh, through Cardinal Spellman, promoting the Vietnam War. Catholics where they were holding hands with Ho Chi Minh, so they were doing with both parties. I showed you an article where, the C, uh, where it's public knowledge from a mainstream news source that CIA government, consist, a lot of the heads consisted of Catholics. So there's no doubt about it. It's like Catholics screaming everywhere. So they had power, they had connections everywhere. There was absolutely no doubt about it. So then the Catholic, so then Catholic power, Catholic influence is everywhere in our American European culture. You have to remember that. It's everywhere. Think about Europe, think about America. One of the most powerful religions you can think of, or one of the largest religions you can think of, would be Catholicism. So they have a hand everywhere. Communism, because uh, they came out the winners as well in World War II, and still it's ongoing today, it became more of a communist culture as well. And the reason why is because uh, we're living, uh, you're seeing it more and more, how schools have been pushing Marxism. So that's a no-brainer. Remember, communism came from Marxism. They like to distinguish the two, but it don't matter. The point is, is that communism came from Marxism, even if you claim that they're both different. But what they share in similarity, which you also can't deny, is that you have to do something mandatory. It's not voluntary. See, so you have to force something to bring in your beneficial kingdom or government or through uh, good means for all of society. So the point is, is that it gives more government control. That's what it uh, shares, see, with communism, Marxism. It's more government control, more government power. Why? To bring in the kingdom, to bring peace to everybody. Everybody has equality and equal share and stuff like that. So uh, it's more of a communist Catholic culture. So this is the domination now in 20th to 21st centuries. And like I told you before, nearly every one of us unconsciously is influenced by this culture, I believe very strongly. Some kind of Catholic, communist influence. Uh, nearly all denominations of Christian, and I'm talking about saved Christian churches today, they are joining the ecumenical movement and Catholics are involved with that one. Okay, so all of us have been tied or influenced uh, by a Catholic communist culture. There's no doubt about it. Even, let's say, for the equality thing, for example. All right, when you hear that, then automatically we've been influenced by it because the evidence is when we talk about discrimination or racism that we get very sensitive and we're touchy and we kind of get in a defense mechanism, right? You can be a hardcore Bible believer, but that defense mechanism will still kick in. Why? Because we've been influenced by this culture. It's that strong. See, so you have to understand this. 
there is no doubt all of us have been unconsciously affected by this, a Catholic communist culture. So then, Christianity, when they went through that revised version, they've now entered this culture. The ones who stood out, who wouldn't join the modern movement, is the independent fundamental Baptist church. So the independent fundamental Baptist church were the ones that stood out strong. But notice right here that they're entering this Catholic communist culture as well. So they're getting more influenced by it. The only thing that could save you, and this is all Laodicea, see? This is the Laodicean age. This is the Philadelphian age right here. In the Laodicean age, what could only save you that time is you got to get your Bible back. Because if you get the word of God back, you can find right doctrines, right belief to counter this. Why? Because this culture has wrong beliefs. How do you know this is wrong, right? How do you know this is wrong? You can't just argue philosophically, okay, or scientifically. Then uh, nothing is final authority. You need the word of God, okay? And if you have the word of God, it must be correct and true. But remember, the revised version opened that can of worms that it has errors, all right? So then you can play with doctrine now. So then you need the word of God back. So you need the word of God to counter this and right doctrine to counter this. Right. Why right doctrine? Because what are your right doctrines, your right beliefs that counter these wrong doctrines, wrong belief? How can you tell what's right and wrong? Right. Well, unless you know doctrine, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got to realize this. If you have the word of God, you should have doctrine. Yeah. Okay. I have the word of God. Once I read it, I know what the right belief is because of what the Bible says. Right. I know what uh, belief is the same thing like doctrine. Teaching is the same thing like doctrine. I know the right doctrine because of what the Bible says. So right doctrine and the Bible go hand in hand. Now, I want you to go to 2 Timothy 2. Keep your hand in Revelation 6. We'll go back there, all right? <clears throat> Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, if you want to find truth in this day and age of confusion, if you boast yourself to be a truther, then you're going to go by this method. And I don't care if, uh, how, much, how many internet stuff you watched or how much you boast yourself to be a truther. You are not if you don't follow this principle in the Bible. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now notice the last phrase is so important there. Let's start off with the last word in that verse. It says truth, right? So where are you going to find truth? I mean, this day and age of confusion. It's from the word, right? So you need a perfect, correct word. All right, not 200 plus different versions. That's what the revised version did. All right, another thing is not just a correct word, but how to handle it so that you can find truth is rightly dividing. See that? So you have to divide the word of God well. There is a doctrine called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, its method is to divide the Bible. Verses in the Bible where we can find verses that apply to the right group of people, the right time period. So remember, we went through our history in dispensationalism. Schofield, Larkin helped immensely in that. But this right doctrine, dispensationalism, and the right word of God is being attacked when we come back over here. All right. Because of that revised version, it did a, a full swing job. Because even Schofield, Larkin, the one who opened the doors for dispensationalism, they use revised version. So they've been influenced by this mentality. The independent fundamental Baptist church has also been influenced by the revised version mentality. They either, su they either supported the manuscripts behind the revised version or they believed the King James Bible had errors. 
So that's the revised version mentality. That's a revised mentality. That's the modern mentality. That's the mentality that the old traditional ways that God has used is not right. It needs to be corrected. Okay, so I hope you're following so far. A revised culture, modernized culture is so dangerous. So notice that the independent fundamental Baptist church have been influenced by that. This consequently brought, cor this corrected now the right doctrine. Dispensationalism. The best method to find truth now. The best method to find right doctrine today. If you want to know why our church is different from 90% of churches here, if not 99% of churches, the simple answer is this simple doctrine called dispensationalism, rightly dividing. You're going to find out majority of churches don't do that. Uh, so this dispensationalism, which Schofield Larkin did, it eventually became revised dispensationalism. So now you don't have right doctrine to counter this culture, to counter the wrong belief system, because your right beliefs are now being revised due to a final authority and the word of God that you're using that's been revised. Do we follow so far? Okay, that's where we're at, okay? That's the day and age that we're at. Okay, now that I summarized everything, uh, I'm going to break it apart one at a time, and then uh, we're going to see uh, how this all works. Okay, now, 20th to 21st century, uh, I told you before, this is how very close we are uh, to the rapture. So let's uh, move this along here. Uh, it's doing it again. Hold on. Point. All right. It's not, it, brother, it's, not, it's, it's acting up. Can I? So after you click it, you can just hand it again. Click that, and then you can change it. Yeah, this thing's acting up. It's, it's full of the devil. All right, well, anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, can, can you come here, brother? That's weird. Yeah, I don't know. That's, well, it's full of devils. <laughs> yeah, that's all I can say. I did that same thing. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, all right then. All right. Now, if you see this 20th to 21st centuries, right? Rewind in our uh, about two history lessons ago. Okay. So let me summarize, review again. Okay. Remember, in the 20th to 21st centuries. Don't forget that we're at a time that if this is where the rapture is, okay? It's this close. Now, I don't know how many more years may pass, but it's, but it's extremely close. So the 21st century could be that final century because I'm going to show you why we are extremely close as we compare with tribulation. Okay, now the tribulation time period, which goes on for seven years, as many of you know, is an era of a uh, reign of terror under the Antichrist. And what a lot of people already know is that the Antichrist, he has a one world government. So there are many who also know that Globalists and elites today, or government leaders today, they are prepping up to a one world system, a one world government. So they also know there will one time be Lucifer incarnate who will come down and rule over the world. So we've already seen how the globalists have set up everything, right? So if I've explained all of that, there is no doubt about that. I've also explained some interesting things in the 20th to 21st century, uh, which I recommended uh, the book. It's called The Third Reich uh, by Earl Johnson. And I've read to you events that were going on in 20th to 21st century that showed you that we already have all the chess pieces in place. 
That, that's how close we are to tribulation. We have all the chess pieces in place, all the catastrophes, all the things in the government, everything set up. All you need is just a leader now. That's all you need to wait for, just the Antichrist to step in, and that's it. That's how extremely close we are. Now, take it for granted, I'm sure that there are a few other missing pieces, and I can notice them too. But when you look at the 20th to 21st century, I mean, we are this close. You could pretty much work with the pieces you have now to bring in the Antichrist. That's how extremely close that we are. Now, I've ex explained that several history lessons ago. I read his book, which showed you that, oh, wow, it can be any moment now. They're all looking for a Messiah. They're just waiting for that Messiah to deliver. We have the event set up. But what I'm going to do now is go through the six seals of Revelation, which I did before as well. But I'm going to expound it further now through uh, history. So I'm going to read some, uh, where I'm going to read an article showing the history of 20th and 21st century. And I want you to take these events in our 20th to 21st century history and then see how it can match with six seals. That's how close we are, see? So in the tribulation, there are six seals. And then, uh, let's see right here. In the six seals of uh, Revelation, let me try to make this more red. All right, here we go. Each seal will pretty much show you how we can match up to the 21st century. Showing you that, hey, if these seals are going to break loose in the tribulation and they're matching up with the 21st century, then you might as well pretty much say that the tribulation can be underway any moment. That's why some people would think that the tribulation is going on right now. Because you can see events that are going on right now that match with the seven seals. The only difference is that it doesn't match uh, in every detail, word for word, with the seven seals. That's the only thing. But you can see that it's, we're right on the borderline. So when we go through uh, the six seals, uh, not seven, the seventh is a separate thing, so let me erase that one. So as we go through the six seals, let's go to Revelation 6, and then we're going to compare, all right? I'm going to uh, bring my Bible over there. Now, there's not a lot of stuff that I could find covering the history of our 21st century because it's still fresh and new, actually. So obviously, the one that would be the most updated would be Wikipedia. So what I'm going to do, and uh, onliners don't throw a fit, okay? So I don't believe everything Wikipedia says, but... I'm just going to simply go by what is mainstream, all right? I'm going to go by what the public can acknowledge as our history in the 21st century. And then what I'm going to do is see if it matches up with each seal in Revelation 6, all right? Now, uh, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 6, and then I think it would be better if I start uh, reading from the history article, and then we can match with the verse, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. So, uh, I didn't do that. Okay. Oh, that's what just happened there. Okay, I just, what's that? Swords. This one, right? You're talking about this one? Can you help me out? Can you help me out? Sorry, I'm still new to this board, guys, so it's just new. C front. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. I can't do that shortcut method, it looks like. Uh, and then, no, once you get it set up, then you can. Then it can do that. Yeah. I did that before, so I don't know what happened. But that whiteboard's now gone, too, so I'll have to go. Do we know how to go back to that whiteboard? It's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah no. it's gone. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. We can I'll have to go back to the source then. Okay, home. All right. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll know what to do when okay. I do that. All right, thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. All right, so I'm still learning this. Okay, let's, let's go here, all right? 
All right, the 21st century right here. The 21st century is the current century in the Anno Domini or Common Era in accordance with the Gregorian calendar, blah, blah, blah. Skipping down, the rise of a global economy and third world consumerism marked the beginning of the century along with increased private enterprise and deepening concern over terrorism after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The NATO interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq in the early 2000s and the overthrow of several regimes during the Arab Spring in the early 2010s led to mixed outcomes in the Arab world, resulting in several civil wars and political instability. The United States has remained the sole global superpower, while China is now considered an emerging superpower. So notice those two uh, winners again, the United States of America and the communist culture. All right. In 2022, 45% of the world's population lived in some form of democracy, though only 8% lived in full democracies. The United Nations estimates that by 2050, two-thirds of the world's population will be urbanized. The world economy expanded at high rates from $42 trillion in 2000 to $94 trillion in 2021, Though many economies rose at greater levels, some gradually contracted. The European Union greatly expanded in the 21st century, adding 13 member states. That's a good number in your Bible. All right. But the United Kingdom withdrew. Most EU member states introduced a common currency, the euro. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was also greatly expanded, added, adding 11 member states. Now, notice that so far... Uh, we see right here, everything is becoming one world, right? That's the bottom line, one world. So nation, even though that there are some rogue nations, it is being stamped out or swallowed up or conjoining with this one world, uh, this one world entity that's becoming. Now look at Revelation chapter 6. The only thing that's just missing is the Antichrist then. See, that's how close we are. Revelation 6, verse 1. Here's the first seal. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. Notice right here this part, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So see, they're uh, stamping out the nations that would not submit to his authority. Notice that these uh, countries are being conquered right now. They're either being defeated or conjoining uh, with the United Nations. It's just missing that ruler, see? That's the only thing missing. Now, the next part right here, notice in verse 4, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So notice right here that now it's a horse named War, named War. So there's a red horse. His job is to take peace from the earth. So here are your other nations then who are not listening to the Antichrist nations at verse 2. So when you are to think about it, there are two groups that you can think about, and those would be the communists and the Muslims. So the com uh, communist and Muslim nations are the ones who are not submitting. And that's during the 21st century we've seen a lot of bloodshed. Now the interesting thing is when you think about these two groups, communist and Muslim, it's like matching verse 4. For example, the communist color is red at verse 4. For example, uh, the religion of Islam is the one that practices and their Quran actually states to kill people by a sword. Notice that a sword is mentioned at verse 4. Uh, it is not a religion of peace. It is terror, right? So notice that verse 4, to take peace from the earth. So uh, we can see that uh, verse 4 can match well with the communist and Muslim nations at that time. Now, uh, when we go to verse <clears throat> five, five, so we cover the first seal, notice. Let's return. I'll have to do the long way. Da, 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 da. File viewer, then right here. All right. 
Uh, when we return to this board and go to the, uh, it's doing it again, it's doing it again. It won't listen to me. Push this and move it, okay. <laughs> All right, and it just deleted, okay, it just deleted, rats, okay. Uh, no, I'm going to draw it again, it's, it's, it's necessary, okay. Let's shrink this one. All right, all right, all right, so this is rapture, and then remember, the tribulation is over here. And notice that we've covered the, if we look at this timeline, this is us, right? How close are we? Uh, very close, because we already covered first seal, second seal. It matched with some events in the 21st century, you notice, right? All right, now let's come to number three here. So this is famine. Notice right here, the Bible says, at verse five, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see, and I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, we see right here that uh, the economy is falling apart. When we go back, uh, let's see, hopefully it will, yeah, It was this one, right? Okay, yeah. All right. When we go back here, uh, in, it says right here, when we come to this part, okay, in early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic began to rapidly spread worldwide, killing over 6.95 million people around the globe and causing severe global economic disruption including the largest global recession since the Great Depression. And uh, don't forget that we had a uh, recession as well during Obama's time. So we see the economy that it is falling apart, and a lot of people are very concerned with the economy now. So notice that the third seal is matching up. It's just any moment now, right? Now, the weird part is when we go to verse 8, all right? Uh, go to, keep your hand here and go to Matthew 24, all right? Keep your hand here and go to Matthew 24. Now, I'm going to read it to you because we don't have much time and I got to get going. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So the fourth seal is unleashed. And that fourth seal is actually, uh, when we're looking at 21st centuries, how will it match? How will it match with death and hell? Because uh, the 21st century boasts that uh, we've got rid of a lot of sicknesses and diseases more than ever before. Well, the key is actually that Death is referring to some particular scourge or pestilence that can wipe out a lot of people in the world. Now, that would be totally unheard of in the 21st century until 2020 came. Then you thought that what was supposed to be back at the Dark Ages is happening in our advanced scientific achievement. How about that, right? So uh, notice that death is actually referring to pestilence when we go to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Notice uh, when we go to verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. <clears throat> so that's the second seal, right? War. And there shall be famines. There's your third seal. And what? Pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So notice that disease, pestilence, is included here. That's why when we go to Revelation 6, 8, it makes sense why death is spreading around the world. Um, so we see pestilence. And then from what we read in the article, we got that pandemic that spread around the world. And according to Mr. Bill Gates... 
and concerns from Fauci and other people, they claim that this can happen again. So notice right here that we are this close. Now, let's look at, uh, let me do this to be on the safe side. Um, so we see famine, we see disease. Now we're going to come to the fifth seal. The fifth seal, notice, is God's people being persecuted. In verse 9, Revelation 6, 9, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost not thou avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So then, uh, in our society, what would be the... The threat. What would be the uh, the bad guys that the majority of news media would concentrate upon? They don't really concentrate much on the real enemies. What they concentrate upon, notice, is what they call hate groups. Now, in our media and our liberal world that we live in today, what they are very antagonistic towards is the nation of Israel as well as the Christian churches. Now, when you think about that, in the tribulation... The Jews are going to be used by God again, but then it's not a problem for the whole world to turn against them. I remember from Johnson's book that I read to you, which should be alarming, Islam is growing, but Judaism is shrinking. Here's another thing. Liberalism and other uh, false beliefs are increasing. Modern society is increasing because churches are shrinking. Why? The, churches that are, the church attendance that is dropping is because they're joining the modern society. Okay, so this should be very alarming to you. This should be very eye-opening to you. It's pointing out that it's paving the way for what? The fifth seal. Where God's people, uh, whether they're the Jew or the Gentile believer during the tribulation, that the, the whole world will soon outnumber them and persecute them. Why? Because the antagonism's already there. Yeah. And it's been amping up more and more and more. Exactly. Then you saw your peaceful protests, what, the last two years? Yeah. And you see, who, uh, you see how very peaceful they are. Yeah. See, the antagonism's already stirred in their spirit. If you're to street breach in the middle of that protest, I wonder if you will not be killed. See? That's how close we are, you have to realize. That's how close we are. Now, uh, when we are to uh, continue down here, we go to the next verse. Go back to Revelation 6 and then verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. All right, so notice that the environment, the world is falling apart. What is one of the most concentrated things uh, that the world is focusing on today? Uh, yeah, it's global warming, the environment, the environment. So notice that that has been heavily concentrated upon in our modern society. That's why they make a big deal about that. They, so notice that they're wasting uh, so much money to protect the environment that will, is predicted by Scripture, fall apart anyway. So when we look at, uh, let's see right here, uh, this, art, this part of the article, effects of global warming and rising sea levels exacerbated the ecological crises with eight islands disappearing between 2007 and 2014. Interestingly, the Bible talks about, in verse 14, Revelation 6, 14, an island were moved out of their places. So the economy is, I mean, not the economy, the environment is falling apart. So we see the sixth seal underway. Now, I don't believe the global warming that, that is uh, taught by your typical liberal universities or the mainstream, but the point is, it, the point is, even if it were true that the environment is falling apart, 
then that would match up with uh, Revelation 6, showing you that the sixth seal could happen any moment. That's how close we are. That's the whole bottom line, what I'm trying to show you through these uh, six seals in Revelation. So that means you got to realize, we're, uh, where are we? You are here, somewhere here. It's, it's like this close. Now, so the events are all set up. All you need, the missing piece, like I keep telling you, like Johnson mentioned that. It's just they need a Messiah. Now, how many are longing for a Messiah right now? Why is it so many people are now into voting more than ever before? Why are people concentrating more on elections than ever before? See, it's that everybody is looking for the leader to fix things. Everybody is. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, it don't matter. Everybody is looking for that. That's why the devil is amping that up more and more and more. So people can get sick and tired, sick and tired, sick and tired, and eventually want a leader who can resolve everything. All right, we're this close. Then uh, what can rescue everything? What can rescue everything? Let's return, okay? If we're this close to the tribulation, and you and I are right here. Let's increase this one. If we're this close, you and I are right here. What is going to counter this culture, right? We have to realize this. Our battle then is we have to battle this culture. We have to battle this culture. We don't want to go with this flow and then, and, uh, and then be like the rest of modern society during the tribulation, right? Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to be raptured, but there's going to be other believers uh, after the rapture. So what is it that... God's believer, the believers of God won't end up in that kind of society, the, which is the Antichrist culture, Antichrist society. How do we counter this? You got to go back in history. A lot of people don't think about that, including independent fundamental Baptist churches and I'm sad to say Bible believers, okay? Uh, that's why history is so important. I would probably even dare say even the people in our church. All right, I would probably even dare say that. You don't want to follow this flow, all right? We've all been affected. There's no doubt about it. You and I agree with that. You don't want to follow this. Then how are we going to uh, counter this? How are we going to attack this? Go back again. You need the right book. That can give the right doctrine. So how many of you are attending a King James only dispensational Bible-believing church? A lot of people aren't interested in that even if you do attend one how much have you been growing getting involved in that church see a lot of people don't care including people in our churches bible believing churches why they are so ignorant of history the culture the society that they're living in so that's why uh, attendance is important volunteering for anything fellowship and then getting involved to teach preach and street preach soul winning and that's so important that's the only thing we can do that's so important so then we need these two things back here we need these two things back how did we end up there well i already covered this part in our history since that's before 20th 21st centuries since i'm now talking about 20th 21st centuries i have to talk about this one which I never went through the history. So how do we end up in revised dispensationalism, right? All right, so we will cover this. Let's see here. So I'm going to show you a lot of uh, interesting history, and then uh, we'll continue on. Let's see here. I'm going to read you a book from uh, Dr. David Walker, and uh, it is called uh, Kate. Uh, King James only revised dispensationalism. King James only revised dispensationalism. I strongly recommend uh, for you to read that one, okay? Now, obviously, I'm going to have to... Uh, ugh, I hate it when you just switched it that way. I don't think I can turn it this way on the board, right? I'll have to turn the iPad, huh? I don't know if it will work. <laughs> turn the TV. Problem solved, right? It's not doing that. I have to edit it. I have to edit the screen itself all the time in order for it to work. Oh, it's a picture. Oh, Roger. 
Yeah, it's a picture, so unfortunately I'll have to do this all the time. All right, here we go. Uh, can I turn this? No, it's not turning. Uh, oh, this one, this one. There we go. All right. All right, here we go. Uh, it's, it's done. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Right. Okay, great. What did I do? just do now? Okay. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're all learning. All right. The revised, <laughs> the revised era of dispensationalism was mainly a rearticulation and softening of former dispensational discussions, such as the overstated dichotomy between law and grace. This adjusting was done to sway the believer from the charge that dispensationalists teach different methods of salvation in different ages. Now, that's uh, very, very enlightening. That's very, very enlightening. Notice that uh, he puts the sources over here as well at the bottom. Amen. He puts the sources as well here in the bottom. In other words, what's going on is this. Schofield and Larkin, they paved the way for dispensationalism. But now the devil's crowd is countering that. They're arguing against it. They're arguing that if you argue for dispensationalism, you have to argue different methods of salvation, which we agree with, which we agree with. That's where the classic dispensationalist movement under Schofield and Larkin, who were seeing that but didn't have much time or didn't really get into those subjects, but if you gave it a lot more years, we would have gotten there. So they were just discovering it. But then there was a guy who changed all of that and turned it into revised dispensationalism. So several of the opponents, opponents of dispensationalism, who are anti-dispensational, they claim that this dispensationalism movement that got rid of different salvations, that they revised what Schofield and Larkin and the classical dispensationalists would have brought in. That's our history. I don't know if you knew that. A lot of Bible believers don't know that. And they need to know that history and be very strong on dispensational salvation. A lot of them have weakened their resolve on that. When you weaken your resolve on that one, when we go back to our history, you're weakening a lot of doctrines that we could use to counter against that culture. Okay? So let's see what's going on here with the classic dispensationalists who are getting there, who are discovering some of these inklings. The clearest example of these revisions is seen in the New School Field Reference Bible, where repetitive statements are made affirming that there is only one basis of salvation, that is by grace through faith. The note in John 1.17 was changed to teach salvation by faith in every age, while the remark in 1 John 3.7 on personal righteousness under the law was removed altogether. Then they deleted the part of Schofield's note on the Edenic covenant, referring to a condition of salvation in the covenants. They also cleaned up the note on the Lord's Prayer and added additional notes proliferating the idea that the method of salvation in Old Testament and New Testament is the same. See that? The revised dispensationalists we're getting rid of what the classic dispensationalists were discovering about different salvations. That's important to understand. Who's the guilty guy? Charles Ryrie. He's the guilty guy. Okay? Charles, uh, let's see, can I draw? No, it's not drawing right now. Okay, forget it. All right. Charles Ryrie went to great lengths in his book, Dispensationalism, originally Dispensationalism Today, 1966, to answer charges by Reformed theologians. So those are the Reformed theologians, the Calvinists. Those are the guys who are anti-dispensational. So Ryrie, he was getting this pressure by scholars who, like Gerstner, who understandably observed that, so Gerstner is a very um, respect, uh, respected scholar, okay? So what did Gerstner say? He said... Uh, Come on, come on, come on, come on. There you go. All right, switch. All right. No, ah, I just, uh, that wasn't Gerstner. Okay. Everything is falling apart here. Okay, here we go. Dispensationalists roundly assert that Old Testament people were saved by Christ. 
There is no way in their theological system they could be. Gerstner, referencing the dispensational distinction between Israel and the church, rightly asked, if these are two different people, how can they have the same salvation? So notice that anti-dispensationalist scholars are more honest than people who claim to be dispensationalists today. They're actually revised dispensationalists. So remember, revised dispensationalists, they get rid of anything that has to do with different salvations in the Bible or dispensational salvations. They want to argue one salvation plan. But that's pretty dishonest because the anti-dispensationalists can see that, look, if you're dividing different groups of people, different time periods here, you got to see different salvations. Yeah, right. Indeed, this is the crux of the matter and emphasizes the soteriological distinctions within dispensationalism. Ryrie also devoted an entire chapter in his book refining the dispensational scholar's position on dispensational salvation. His summary is as follows. The basis of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. The requirements for salvation in every age is faith. The object of faith in every age is God. The content of faith changes in the various dispensations. The basis of salvation is always the death of Christ. The means is always faith. The object is always God. Though man's understanding of God before and after the incarnation is obviously different, but the content of faith depends on the particular revelation God was pleased to give at a certain time. So this is very important. When you go to uh, dispensationalist churches, you are likely attending a revised dispensational church due to, the, due to revised scholars who brought in revised teachings to a revised society. Can I repeat that again? Due to modern scholars bringing modern teachings to a modern society. Does this make sense? So remember, that's a negative reference. Negative when you hear revised and modern and these guys. That means the traditional, see, what they taught before is incorrect. We need to correct that. See, that's very important. When they try to argue that Schofield, Larkin never taught dispensational salvation, that's pretty a dishonest way to say it, all right? Why don't you say Larkin and Schofield, why don't you instead say that they taught only one salvation all the time? Why don't you say it that way? Now, is it true that maybe that they did? Sure, maybe they did. But because they were classic dispensationalists, going by the tradition principles, they were discovering things in the salvation itself that were distinct and different. That's a problem. And the revised dispensationalists saw that, so they had to get rid of any of those traces. That's a problem right there. But give it 10 more years with Schofield Larkin when they hit Ruckman's time, wonder what would have happened. See that? They didn't think about that. Now, for some of you who don't know Ruckman, we'll cover him later, but he was the key who changed everything. We're trying to show that he revived or he studied further into that dis, uh, different salvations in the dispensationalism. Picked off where Schofield and Larkin left off and then was able to clarify that more so. All right, now um, let me go back here. Dr. Walker says, this is important. To the Bible believer, the logical conclusions, this is page four, of rightly dividing were only as good as the Bible itself. Inspiration was correctly understood to not merely apply to the original manuscripts, but to an actual book that can be studied, the King James authorized version. This meant that pastor popes who privately interpret the scripture with their cute sayings could be challenged because the power was in the word of God, not the word of men. So notice that uh, our position of dispensational salvation or our, our version of dispensationalism, what we teach, is very aligned with the KJV-only movement. Basically, final authority. KJV Bible, right Bible, correct Bible, with right doctrine, dispensationalism. Remember, what was revised? The Bible, revised version, and dispensationalism, revised dispensationalism. See that? Now you got no weaponry or artillery, artillery to counter that Catholic communist culture. See that? That's why I'm going to this history. That's important. And shamefully, okay, Bible, some Bible-believing churches do not see that importance, and I hope that all of them are watching me and hearing me. 
All right? Because we're too lost in our fellowship with other IFB pastors we don't want to offend. But see, we're following that flow of the IFB people who are following a revised society. I refuse to follow that trend. We're all influenced, I told you. We're all influenced by that. All right. Now, continuing on. Uh, la, 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 la. This further led to honestly approaching the Bible in humble belief as a student, not a scholar. The outcome was an ardent belief in dispensational salvation. That salvation conditions are different regardless of what scholarship says or has said in the past. The King James only movement and this brand of dispensationalism are inseparably linked. Okay? Unfortunately, some King James only preachers and authors today are espousing revised or normative dispensationalism. They cite theologically with Bible correctors, assuming the distinguishing differences between Israel and the church are only ecclesiolo uh, ecclesiological, dealing with the church, or eschatological, dealing with prophecy, and not soteriological, dealing with salvation. That's important because, remember, Larkin and Schofield, uh, if it weren't for them, then uh, they wouldn't have saved our society. A lot of churches, I told you, are influenced by Baptist culture, by Baptist tradition. That included dispensationalism. So big-time prophecy scholars you hear about in the charismatic movement or mega churches, they have to use some of uh, Larkin or Schofield stuff. That's how powerful we were. But the problem is with those guys, because of that revised movement... See, that revised movement, uh, like uh, Dr. Walker argued, they can only go so far. They'll only go eschatological end times. They'll only go with the church, difference of Israel and church. But they won't go with salvation. They won't go with all branches right here. They won't go all the way. Dr. Walker says, in other words, they claim that even, quote, under the Old Testament law, salvation was available to the sinner not by the works of the law, but by grace through faith. Now, that's not true. We believe in the Old Testament, which is why cults keep using these verses, where there are works involved for salvation. When you read the verse right here, it does show that in the Old Testament, so then what we do is simple. That's for Old Testament. It's called Old Testament. It's not called New Testament. It's Old Testament. But you see, Christians, you know what they try to do? They revise the verse to their interpretation trying to pretend there is no work salvation there. That's why cults can see the dishonesty with some Christians interpreting scripture. See that? Now, continuing on. Uh, they maintain in every age salvation comes by faith and is offered and granted through grace. These authors, by their own admission and obvious absence of quoted source material or very limited references uh, in their books, let's see right here, are very careful not to name the King James only authors they are attempting to refute or the apostates their ideas line up with. Uh, I'm not going to show you those footnotes, but if I show you those footnotes, some of you, uh, some of you Bible believers, yes, would be shocked and say, oh no, not that pastor. All right, so you, uh, I would advise, so I, I, I'll try not to mention the names, but you buy these booklet, you buy that booklet and see for yourself. Amen. You Bible believers have been influenced by that revised culture. Yeah. I refuse to do that, all right? I refuse to do that. I want to stick to that, uh, the, gr the good line in history and not be influenced by anything of the satanic line or a satanic cultural line or a revised cultural line led by the devil, Okay. Now, anyways, uh, these IFB pastors, big names that you're going to hear about, okay, that uh, the author is referring to here, the reason why they won't name these KJV authors is because they know once they mention the name, so-and-so is going to look up their name and then buy their books or watch their videos, and they're going to become like us, Bible believers. They don't like that. They don't like that. They piously profess to be concerned with what is being taught, not with the men themselves, and religiously follow certain rules for writers like eliminate quotations. 
These authors are specifically targeting Bible believers who have either espoused the truths of dispensational salvation personally or been taught it by their pastors. They are attempting to undermine true King James-only dispensationalism and are, in effect, reverting back to revised dispensationalism, Ryrie, Pentecost, LaHaye, etc., at worst, or, and he's trying to give the best-case scenario for them, or classical dispensationalism, Scofield, Larkin, Haldeman, Blackstone, etc., at best. These preachers and authors are advocating a King James-only brand of revised dispensationalism, one that makes no distinction between salvation differences throughout the various ages of human history. Now, here's the interesting history of Schofield and the other classical dispensationalists, all right? Although classic dispensationalists failed to pinpoint and clarify the biblical truth of dispensational salvation, and I don't blame them, they didn't have technology. I mean, they just started this, all right? Do you know how heavy dispensationalism doctrine is? All right? You got to give a lot of credit to Schofield and Larkin and these guys. They discovered, like, so much stuff, all right? Our bunch, we just piggybacked where they left off and we were able to discover more things. So we can't be really too hard on Schofield and these guys, okay? But anyway, he's going to point you something interesting about these guys. C.I. Schofield's note on John 1.17 was later referred to as the two ways of salvation debate. Because it, was, because it was indicating dispensational salvation. He was getting there. He was getting there. Because it reflected the biblical idea that salvation is not the same in each dispensation. All right, so you know what it was? It's 1134, isn't it? Would you like me to read the quote at least? Okay, all right. Law is commit. Connected with Moses and works. Uh, uh, law is connected with Moses and works. Grace with Christ and faith. Law demands that blessings be earned. Grace is a free gift. As a dispensation, grace begins with the death and resurrection of Christ. The point of testing is no longer legal obedience as a condition of salvation, but acceptance or rejection of Christ. And we'll end it here. I'll read you more of the goodies from Schofield's notes and other stuff, okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, I pray that uh, today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. We'll understand our history more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.